Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. One of the most crummy feelings you'll ever have is when you realize you've disappointed someone in authority. Maybe it was a coach or a boss or a teacher or a parent, and they become so disappointed in you, they turn their gaze to someone else and pretty much leave you behind. That's a pretty lousy feeling. And in Isaiah 49, the Lord anticipates that this is how Israel will feel when the Lord establishes his new kingdom with a new covenant filled with a new Israel. And so he has a message for his people here in Isaiah 49 to encourage them that he has not forsaken them. Now, as we turn to Isaiah 49, we turn to what is the, the next official servant song in the book of Isaiah. By way of quick review, the book of Isaiah contains four officially recognized servant songs, and we're looking at each of these in our study together. These official servant songs are Isaiah 42, 49, 50, and the last one which spans the very end of chapter 52 into chapter 53. The reason why we're studying these servant songs is to have an accurate understanding of the message of Isaiah and understand the themes that he's been diving into. And so far, we have seen that Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, has a consistent theme that Israel has broken her covenant with God. She's abandoned the Lord. She's gone after cisterns without water. If she has any relation with the Lord, it's just based on rote memorization and just dead orthodoxy. We've also seen the Lord's indictment upon the nations, that they too have disregarded the Lord. And so we're seeing the Lord's judgment coming upon Israel as well as the nations, and he's going to establish a new kingdom where it's going to be filled with people who truly obey him and walk with him and won't stray from him anymore. And so as we've been going through the book of Isaiah, we're seeing that this new kingdom has a new ruler. He will be in the Davidic line. He'll be regarded as a king, and yet he'll be fully man. His rule and his authority will be unlike any other person. He will be a great individual. He will be of character and fortitude that has never been seen in this world. Thus, in his kingdom, he will rule with equity and justice, holiness and wisdom in all of his judgments. He will tolerate no injustice. He will right every wrong, and people will obey him and walk with him as their king. And so we've been seeing this already through the book of Isaiah. Now that we come to Isaiah 49, now that we come to what's called the second servant song, it is now the servant himself. And he is speaking to the people of the old covenant, letting them know that although he's got this new thing he's doing, he has not forsaken them. And so let's work through this chapter and see what the Lord is telling us. And let's listen to the servant speak to us here, starting in verse 1. Verse 1 says, Listen to me, O islands, and pay attention, you people from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother, he named me. And so this is the servant speaking here. And right from the start, we see that the Lord has set his eyes beyond the edges of Israel. He is talking to the far nations here as well. And he's telling all of the world that he has been set apart by God even before he was born. And this just goes back to the nature of who this servant is. We're seeing here that he is speaking to the people 700 years before he's even born. And that shows us he's going to be born here. He's fully human here in verse 1. But he's also God in the flesh because he is speaking to them 700 years before he's even born. And so we're going to also see that down in verse 23, that he is the Lord. Well, going on to verse 2, the servant now tells us that God has given him a message that he must wield like a sword. He's like an arrow, he says, being sent out from God to this world, even to the Gentiles. In verse 3, he's been chosen by the Lord to show the Lord's glory. And so now as you just pause and think about these opening verses, these show us that the servant of God is a specific individual. He is someone who is actually talking to them. Remember, there's that debate, is this servant Israel or is it someone else? Well, here we're seeing it's a specific individual who is talking to them. He's not a nation. He's not a group. He is a person who is dwelling with the Lord in heaven right now, but he will one day come upon this earth. And so when we go to verse three, here he is citing what the father has said to him. He says, you are my servant Israel. Now, what does that mean? Is it talking about the nation of Israel? Well, I don't think so. I I believe this phrase here, you are my servant Israel, is being spoken of directly to Jesus here. And the point is, is that he is the new Israel. He is this new Israel from whom will come a spiritual nation. Remember, the name Israel is actually just another name for Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons. The children of Israel are really the children of Jacob. And so I believe the Lord is just making a simple allusion here. Just as Jacob was also called Israel, and from him came the 12 tribes of Israel, here the Lord is calling this this servant Israel, and from him will be this new nation, this new people of God. And so now as we work through this passage, we'll see that this second Israel, this new Israel, will come from all of the nations as well as the Jews themselves. And in verse 3, it's this new Israel that the Lord will now show his glory. Well, going on to verse 4. Verse 4 speaks of the disappointment that this servant feels with this task. And this is just prophetically pointed to the fact that Jesus will experience rejection from the old Israel at his first coming. We know that. Obviously, they reject him. They crucified him. And verse 4 is just letting us know that's not a surprise. That's not new. It's going to happen. 
verse 7, if you glance down there, it describes the servant as one who has been despised, uh, the abhorred one by the nation. And so his rejection by his own people was prophesied all along. And this rejection, if for the most part, continuing even now, because Paul tells us in Romans eleven twenty five, 25, there's this partial hardening going on, but it will one day come to an end. And so in God's grace, uh, the old Israel, the people that he's speaking to right here, they're actually not going to be done away with. And if you look at verse 5, it says that in this new Israel, the Lord will still regather Jacob and Israel. Now, verse 5 says they'll be gathered to him, this servant, because the servant will be honored in the sight of the Lord. And so the only salvation for Jacob and Israel now is to gather to Christ as their Lord and King. And this idea continues in verse 6 where he is to restore the preserved ones of Israel. That's speaking of the remnant that's so often spoken about in the prophecies. But if you look carefully at verse 6, verse 6 also adds to this task. It says, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and destroy the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. And so here now the Father is describing the plan and the mission of this Messiah, that it's too great a mission just to be limited to Jacob and Israel, that this citizenry of this new kingdom will be comprised of people who have been saved from out of this world all around the earth. And so although this is not the first time we're hearing that the doors of the kingdom is open to the whole world, this continues to reinforce that message. The new kingdom will not just be the ethnically Jewish. It will include them, we'll see in a moment, but it'll also include people from every nation, every tribe. And therefore in verse seven, there'll even be kings and princes from the nations who will bow before the servant of the Lord. Then as we come to verse eight, once again in verse eight, we see that in God's perfect timing, he will bring the servant whom we now know to be Jesus onto the scene. And this servant will be a covenant for the people. Now we've talked about this already, but just good to remind ourselves here that God is a covenant making God. He made covenants with Adam and Noah and Abraham. Those covenants specifically govern their lives. And each of those covenants were to be ratified with blood. But unlike these previous covenants, here we're saying that the servant is the actual covenant and we're going to see in Isaiah 53, that it is the blood of this servant that's going to be ratifying this covenant. And so at the end of verse 8, this covenant will restore the land and they will re-inherit that which was forsaken. And then going on to verses 9 to 13, those verses unpack what this new restoration will look like. They will have abundance and prosperity. Uh, they will not perish in the scorching heat of the sun. They will have springs of water. It will be a level place. In verse 12, people will come from every point of the compass. And in verse 13, they will come rejoicing and celebrating the Lord and his new work that he is doing among them. Now, with all of this, there are people throughout the centuries who would read these prophecies and conclude that God has forsaken Israel and that the church now replaces Israel. But that's not the case. And we see here starting in verse 14. Verse 14 says, But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. And the Lord is addressing the very real concern that Israel is going to have that the Lord has forsaken her. And so he says in verse 15, Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. And so he's basically saying, Listen, Zion, listen, my people. I love you with an everlasting love. You've rebelled against me, but I will still have compassion on you. Even though the world may forget you, I won't forget you. And thus, God has not forsaken Israel, even though they've rejected him. Going on to verse 16, he says, Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. You see, God bears the name of Israel on his hands. Being on his hands just shows they are in a prominent place. They're, they have a prominent role in his heart and his mind and his plan for this world. God has not forsaken them, and he will never forsake them. Now, sometimes well-intentioned Christians apply this to us. And I believe this principle holds true that God will never forget us either. But the point of verse 16 is letting Israel know that even though God has established a new Israel and a new spiritual nation, God is not turned away from the old Israel. They're not excluded. In fact, in verse 18, he says, Lift up your eyes and look around. All of them gather together and they come to you as I live. You will surely put on all of them as jewels and bind them on as a bride. You see, not only has God not abandoned the Jews, they are such a major part of what the Lord is doing that as he is gathering people out of the world to this new Israel, those people will be like jewelry placed upon the believing Jews who come to Christ. And so they have this role of prominence. Together, the old and the new believers of Jesus Christ, believers in this servant, will gather as his new people. And in verses 19 and 20, this return will be so large, Jerusalem will not be able to contain all these people. 
And then the Lord pauses in verse 22 and gives us this beautiful picture just describing how some of these Jews will come to know the servant as their Lord and King. Verse 22 says, they will bring your sons in their bosom and your daughters will be carried on their shoulders. In other words, the Gentile believers will bring the children of Israel back to God. They will carry these children of Israel to the Lord in their bosoms. They will carry them on their shoulders. Yes, you see this this act of love and redemption going into the people of Israel, bringing them now to this servant. Then verses 22 and 23 encourage them that they will have an exalted place in this kingdom. Kings will guard over them. Princes will care for them. And look what it says in the second to the last line in verse 23. He says, and you will know that I am the Lord. Now, if you look at that word Lord, you'll see that it's all capitalized. And when it's all capitalized, that means it's really Yahweh here. And here we have the servant speaking to his people who have essentially rejected him, but he's telling them that he has not forsaken them, that he will bring them into, into this new kingdom, into this new Israel. And when they come to this servant, they will realize that the servant is Yahweh himself. In other words, Jesus is Yahweh. And they will realize that they crucified Yahweh when they crucified Jesus. And as mind blowing as that is, he ends by just reminding them just to be put in their trust in him, just wait for him, trust in him. They will not be put to shame. And finally, in verses 25 and 26, the Lord has so not forsaken them. He promises he will save their sons and even bring judgment upon anyone who contends with them. And in verse 26, that judgment will be gruesome and terrible. And this right here is just a warning to any nation that would seek to ruthlessly harm the Jews. God watches over them and he has a special plan for them. And he will bring true judgment upon those that would seek to harm the nation of Israel. Okay, so now that's Isaiah 49. Now, what's the takeaway from this chapter? Well, there are so many things we could talk about here, but the most direct application is the clarity of the message from the servant that he has not forsaken Israel. This is the servant's message for his people here. He is calling them to himself. And when they do come to himself, they won't be second-class citizens. They'll be the prodigal son who is particularly celebrated when they repent and return to their Lord. Likewise, as the church... We have a particular responsibility to uphold Israel and to seek to restore her to the king. You see, Jesus is the Jewish king. We've got to remember that. First and foremost, he has come to be king over Israel. And if you and I are not Jewish, this is simply a reflection that we are in this chapter here. God is merciful to us and he's got a mission to save us from the nations. But that doesn't mean he's forsaken Israel. Paul tells us that we're just grafted into the work he's doing among the Jews. So right now, God is ushering in people from around this world and we can come to him celebrating his grace. But still, we have an obligation here. We have the obligation to to carry the Jewish people back to Christ, to carry them on our shoulders back to him. And part of that obligation is just for us to continually love and support the Jewish people. This obligation is also reflected in our seeking to understand, even like, say, the Old Testament, the Tanakh, as they would call it, these covenants that God made with them. When we read these and understand these messages, we can then bring them to these passages here and say, look, God has not forsaken you but you need to come to him through the servant that he has provided, who's the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we understand what their Tanakh says, the Old Testament says, we can just teach them all of these principles. We're pointing to the cross and bringing them to the cross and to the cross of Christ. And we can be praying for opportunities and seeking those opportunities just to share these truths with them. Finally, Psalm 122 verse 6 calls us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And so if you spend time with the Lord after we finish out these podcasts, just praying through this chapter here, How about just praying that the Lord might be working among the Jewish people even now, that even now in Israel or anywhere that Jewish people are gathering, uh, that he would be pricking their heart, that they'd be reading these passages and saying, you know what, that looks like it really points to Jesus, especially when we get to Isaiah 53 in a couple days, and just pray that the Lord would just awaken within them a revival, that they would return to their prophesied King, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's our Lord too, but who is fundamentally the Jewish God and King. And finally, if we ever feel like God has forsaken us, Here we're seeing that once God makes a covenant, he holds on to that covenant. He is faithful to that covenant. And here he's faithful to the people of Israel with the covenant, and he'll be faithful to us as well. And when we come to those places where we just feel discouraged, we just need to know that we can repent like Israel, turn to him, and he'll embrace us back with open arms. He is a God of love. He hasn't forsaken us, and he wants us to walk with him. Well, that's a great place to stop. Thanks so much for listening. Hope you have a great rest of your day. We'll catch up with you tomorrow. God bless. God bless.